Late November 1917, the British Third Army mounts a massive assault on a lightly held segment of the German Hindenburg Line near the city of Cambrai. Allied victory could end World War I, but the outcome of the battle will determine the future of tank warfare. The Tank, ultimate armored weapon of the 20th century, but its beginnings were very unimpressive. continued to fail, British generals considered scrapping it. The tank needed a victory, or it would become obsolete. Tanks weren't really so much ineffective before the Battle of Cambrai as they were misused, and really they were a brand new technology, uh, so they had a lot of limitations. Uh, really, the, the first time that the British used tanks, the Battle of the Somme in 1916, the terrain was so broken that the tanks weren't really able to be used very effectively. November 20th, 1917. Eight British infantry divisions and 324 British tanks plowed through the German Hindenburg Line in a surprise attack. The German-held city of Cambrai was surrounded with barbed wire and protected by two German infantry divisions. However, using the thick armor of the tanks and effective infantry support, the British attack overwhelmed the German positions, catching the enemy by surprise. In one day, the British offensive captured four miles of enemy territory and 8,000 prisoners. For more than a week, the British offensive continued unopposed. However, as casualties mounted, the British Army sent in reinforcements, which were deterred by barbed wire and never arrived. By November 27th, German defenses had claimed two-thirds of the British tank armada. The giant armored invasion no longer existed. On November 30th, a massive German counterattack retook all the land captured in the initial invasion, and the tank's success at the Battle of Cambrai was forgotten by all but one man, J.F.C. Fuller. J.F.C. Fuller learned three things from the Battle of Cambrai. One, tanks should only be used with infantry support. Two, without smooth, firm terrain, tanks would be useless. Three, Tanks would only be effective when used in mass. Fuller saw the potential for a fully mechanized thrust, where all branches were mechanized and they went into battle fully mechanized. And I think the U.S. decided we weren't going to all be one homogenized mechanized branch. They broke us out into the three branches. Cavalry, which turned into armored cavalry, and then armor and infantry. Although most of the world rejected Fuller's ideas, two American officers saw potential in armored warfare. At Fort Meade in Maryland, Colonel Georges Patton and Colonel Dwight D. Eisenhower began devising new and effective tank tactics. Uh, now on the British side, Fuller uh, was one of the, the advocates uh, for the use of tanks as a primary weapon and uh, Patton's philosophy on the American side kind of mirrored that. He had the same forward thinking attitude towards tanks, that they actually could be a, a primary weapon, they could be a main weapon for an offensive thrust. Uh, and Eisenhower basically followed on with that, that, the, that strategy. Patton summed up his ideas as, the tank is new and for the fulfillment of its destiny, it must remain independent. Patton and Eisenhower were visionaries. And unfortunately,
unfortunately, most of the Army officers at the time were not visionary. They only saw tanks as how they were used in World War I and just wanted to keep using them in the same way. World War I, tanks were infantry support. They were subjugated to the infantry. Patton and Eisenhower realized that tanks were not being fully utilized in warfare, that they should be broken out from underneath the infantry, be made a separate branch, the armor branch, and be given their own doctrine and their own tactics. However, the Between the War armies didn't want to see that happen, and the reason was twofold. The cavalry didn't want to give up their horses. They didn't like the stinking iron boxes. So they were fighting to see armor done away with totally. And the infantry liked the tanks being subjugated to them and they didn't want to give them up. So the few officers that were in the tank school learning and developing US armor doctrine had to fight two sides of their own army to see armor become its own branch and have its own doctrine and tactics. During the late 1930s, Patton and Eisenhower worked on improving tank tactics at Fort Meade in Maryland. However, the tanks they had were too inefficient to be used effectively in battle. Patton and Eisenhower um, saw that there was potential, but they needed to be redesigned. So they had to fight the War Department muckety-mucks who didn't really want to spend the money because in, in the 20s and 30s we had drawn down the army to just bare bones and we were trying to save money after the war. Um, having officers say, well, we need money to develop new equipment, uh, that was a fight in its own right. And then they had to fight people in the armor school who were like, no, no, we don't need to change that much, we need to see what we can do with what we have. So they really fought the good fight. They fought everybody until they got what they wanted, which was enough money to develop different types of armored vehicles. Instead of one type of armor vehicle that was used for everything, they actually developed many different types of armor vehicles that would be used for very specific things. Using J.F.C. Fuller's notes, Patton and Eisenhower revolutionized tank warfare forever. When World War II broke out, America was ready. You know, tanks in World War II were incredibly fast compared to tanks in World War I. So things that might get in trouble with a World War I tank that couldn't maneuver its way out of a tight spot in World War II, it could. It doesn't take much to depress an artillery piece so that it shoots level like a cannon and punch a hole in this very thin armor, which is more than sufficient to protect uh, soldiers from machine gun fire, but is not sufficient to protect the tank from, say, a 77 millimeter shell. So we developed armor that was thicker. And not only did we make it thicker, but we slanted it. And the reason we slanted it is if a shell hits a perpendicular three inch piece of metal, it's going through three inches of metal. But if you slant it and it goes through, it's going through four, maybe five inches of metal. So that was a big lesson we learned. Don't use flat surfaces of armor on our armored vehicles. They have to be angled. The Battle of Cambrai proved J.F.C. Fuller's theories on tank warfare. This proof convinced Patton and Eisenhower to invest in armored warfare. Patton and Eisenhower's contributions to armored warfare made tanks into an effective fighting force.